Okay, um, so today's hepatitis. Yay, everybody loves liver, right? No, not so much. It's okay, we need to know about liver and it's all good. And the slide advances. Yes, okay, today's already a better day, right guys? All right, so here are some objectives if you need them. They're, they'll be in your tape, they're on your Moodle page, they're in your syllabus. All right, so we don't teach, we don't test you on anatomy, physiology, that stuff that you had already in A&P class. But before I can begin liver, because it's complex, we always go back and review certain things about the liver to remind you so we're all on the same page. And a lot of then what I say when the liver doesn't work should make sense if you come back to what the liver does for a living. So that's the, that's the thinking. All right, so here's your liver. And this is a lobule, this little, it's a little piece of lobe, this big thing that's blown up here. There's probably about 100,000, maybe more in your liver. What you see when you look at the liver, a picture of the liver is two big lobes, right? Those two big cleaved lobes. There's 100,000 of these that are inside of it. So inside of these is all this tiny little network of stuff. So just think, it's almost like, oh, sorry. See, yesterday it wouldn't advance and today it's flying. Where am I? Come on, cursor, show up. You know, when you're between divided screens. Okay, um, so it's just like when you studied about your kidney. You know, here's your kidney, yay big. And yet inside it is a million nephrons. And inside nephrons, they have their own capillary network and all these tiny little things that have to work. So it's not hard to understand when someone takes something that's nephrotoxic or something's happening in the body and you're not getting perfusion to your kidney, it's gonna suffer. It has all these minute particles. So in here, you have all these little pink puffy things are all your hepatocytes and you have bile that comes from them. That's the green little dots that's, that are in those pink fellows. And then you have sinusoids and that's all these little canals here. Sinusoids are lined with for cells, you'll remember. So for cells are part of your immune system. They break down you know, bacteria and viruses and toxins and they help keep your liver clean, which is why end-stage liver patients are prone to sepsis and infection. Um, so then you have all these little canaliculi, these green little webby things that go out to bile ducts and then into the common bile duct and then into your gallbladder. All right, so that's where we are. Let me come back, come on cursor. Um, uh, here is your vascularity. Just to remind you, you know, arteries carry away from the heart. So your hepatic artery is taking fresh blood down into your liver to help it work. Your portal vein is coming from the portal system. Portal system is all the mesentery, the splenic circulation, everything that feeds the organs, the spleen and pancreas and intestines and, you know, large and small and all your pelvic organs, everything comes back up to get cleaned up Wait a minute, I have someone coming into the class um, to get cleaned up so that the body can use it. And I advanced a slide on you, sorry about that. Um, so that's your portal system. It's all flooding back to the body to get detoxified. And then it's gonna go out your hepatic vein into your vena cava, which is right here. And it goes back up to the heart again. So it is vascular, make no doubt about it. If you see a piece of liver, just look at the color. Years ago when I used to be a camp counselor and I was on the waterfront, what did we do on the lake? Every year we threw out piece, big chunks of cow's liver in cheesecloth and threw them over the docks. Because if you sent them down, any leeches in the water would go for that, fill up and stay away from your campers. And so at the end of the day, we'd bring up all these things and it would be a white chunk, what looked like lard. All the blood was completely sucked from it. So it's full of blood, it's vascular, all right? So let's touch back, dust off your brain. Another, all these functions now we're gonna go through. Carbohydrate metabolism. This is all that uh, glycogenesis and glucogenesis and glyconeogenesis, all that that your uh, liver does, which is why we can have um, you know, blood sugar problems, energy store issues, all of that. Protein metabolism, your amino acids come out of here, your plasma proteins, a big one's albumin. You know, albumin is what maintains your colloidal oncotic or osmotic pressure to keep your blood in the vascular space and fluid where it needs to be and keeps a balance. They won't have protein like that. They won't have albumin. They won't have transferrin, so they're not transporting ferritin to connect with myoglobin to make hemoglobin, you know, so these become issues. 
um, the formation of urea. When you break down protein in your body, the flora in your uh, colon takes it through a deamination process. It makes it ammonia. Ammonia goes back to your liver. The liver is going to convert it to urea so you can get rid of it. And it can go out in your urine and a little in your stercobalinogen to go out in your stool. So that's an issue. Urea, the conversion of urea gets blocked. Uh, the clotting factors, you know, your prothrombin and, you know, the whole, the whole lot of them that we'll talk about. I think it's on another slide as well. Uh, so they have trouble with clotting. Uh, vitamin, your fat solubles, A, D, E, and K, your B vitamins, which we need for so many things, bloods and, you know, function and neurology and all of that. We need that. So a lot of the issues that these liver patients will have are based on the basic functions of the liver that now no longer function when they have liver disease. So if you're having trouble down the road into slides when you're studying, come back and review the basics so that you um, get your mind around what it should be doing. Now it's disease and it's not doing. It'll explain why we have the problems we have. All right, so your bile production is from the hepatic cells, but it's excreted through the little cannuliculi into the canals, into the bile canal, and it, the common bile duct, and it goes to your gallbladder and it's stored there. So this is why people can live without gallbladders. You don't need a gallbladder. You're still, your hepatocytes, if you have a healthy liver, still gonna make bile, and you need that to help your digestion. Um, the mononuclear phag phagocyte system, this is your cup for cells. It's part of your immune system, and they're gonna detoxify all the stuff that needs to be broken down in your liver, unless it doesn't work. And then you, you know, they're pro prone to gram-negative sepsis especially. Your clotting factors, your fibrinogen, your prothrombin, um, your, your vitamin K dependent clotting factors. And K stands for coagulation. In Germany where they found it, that's how they spell coagulation is with a K. So they know it's an integral part of you clotting. You need your vitamin K. So when you're, you don't have these stores, you can't synthesize it, you can't do anything with it, they have bleeding problems, big bleeding problems. All right, so let's talk about hepatitis. It's a general term for inflammation. I mean, it can have many, many causes. So itis of anything, you know from that term, is inflammation. So it's, but inflammation is dangerous. We know that chronic inflammation from coronary, acute coronary syndrome is problematic. It affects your whole vascular system. We know that anything that is chronically inflamed can cause tissue alterations. So the inflammation, the degree that your liver becomes inflamed will determine the degree of the severity of how sick you are from your liver disease. So we focus a lot on viruses because A through E, the hepatitis A through E are probably the more prevalent things we see when we see liver disease. Um, but we'll go through the, the drugs, other viruses and the drugs and the chemicals and autoimmune diseases and all the things that can affect to cause somebody to have a hepatitis. All right, so viral hepatitis, we're talking about the five main, um, it's not that if you look into CDC research, you're not, you're not gonna see they're thinking of more variety. We'll stay with A through E, it's enough. <laughs> There's other viruses that we'll get into, but as far as these um, major letter viruses, that's what we're gonna look at. They can all have a similar manifestation in the beginning, but they're gonna differ in how your patient gets exposed to it. So what we do is help prevent that. We're gonna help teach people so they don't get exposed to hepatitis. And since you only have one liver and they all um, can vary in their disease course. So any one of the hepatitises can lead you to an end stage liver disease. It's just like we're seeing the variants with COVID. Some people get it and they say, really, I didn't have that much. I've had colds that are worse, lucky them. There's plenty of people we've seen die horrible deaths at Maine. So, on the other extreme, people with the same strain of virus are dead within days from the pneumonia. So the same thing here, somebody can get a hepatitis, you may have had it, hopefully didn't, but you may have had like an A and not even known you had it and you're done with it and you have no clue. It just passed, you thought you had some viral something because you felt malaise or whatever, and it's done. Some people will get that same A and for some reason it takes them on admission. So you just don't know, the clinical course is different. Okay, now there's other viruses. CMV, I have an admission, hold on one second. Okay, um, CMV, cytomegalovirus, you've probably heard that before, right? It's a herpes virus. Herpes is this umbrella of viruses. There's 
hundreds of them. And of the ones we know, we identify because it's helpful for us to know and do research and find drugs and treatment and track severity of cases and all of that. Um, EBV, you probably know this, this Epstein-Barr, this is the one that's um, connected with mononucleosis and chronic fatigue syndrome and all of that. So it could be Epstein-Barr. Uh, Coxsackie virus, if you're listening to my tapes, who knows where Coxsackie, the name Coxsackie came from, anybody? New York. New York. Somebody's listening, yes. So, <laughs> Coxsackie, New York. So anyway, Coxsackie virus, that's an enterovirus. Kids, you see it more in kids probably than you do in adults. Uh, rubella, you all know German measles, it's a virus, don't forget. So can you get a case of rubella and get hepatitis from it? Yes. Do you see that every single day? Probably not, but it's possible. And any of the other herpes viruses, and there's a lot of them, a lot of them. All right, so what happens when we're talking about viral, hep viral hepatitis, what's happening? Well, like anything else, there's a couple of ways to infect a cell. You can either get this viral infection directly. There's some direct exposure that puts it into your blood, mucous membrane, wherever it's going, there's some direct exposure. But a lot of it is through cell-mediated response also. So when we talk cell-mediated response, what do we mean? This brings you back probably to micro. Uh, we're talking about you have these cytokines, these cytotoxic cytokines in your body. Cytotoxic means it's kill cells. Cytokines are just signals. So you get this virus into your body and your immune system reacts and says, wait a minute, send a signal. Something's here. I don't know what it is. Get rid of it. So out go the cytotoxic cells. They mean well. And most times you can fight off a virus and you do well. And there it goes. And you're like, oh, I started not to feel good. I don't know, a day or two, I'm okay now you know, yay for the cytotoxic cytokines that came to your, your rescue. But with the response it gives comes inflammation because that's what your immune system does. So it comes out and it's killing cells and doing what it thinks it should do. In the process, it's causing inflammation. Inflammation over time is going to interfere with bile flow. Think of how tiny, tiny, tiny those hepatocytes are and they secrete the bile. So, you know, they get inflamed all those little tiny sinusoids, the canaliculi, everything's inflamed. Now they're not so delicate a straight shot. Now they're kind of tortuous and swollen, maybe scarred. That's where the problem comes in with hepatitis. All right, so I was just saying this. I sometimes get ahead of myself. So your hepatitis, uh, your hepatocytes get inflamed. Now, if someone has a case of chronic hepatitis, and sometimes they don't know they have it, we'll talk about different forms. And sometimes people don't know they have it, they're carrying it for years. So the whole time it's going through this inflammatory process, because as long as it's in the body, your body's reacting to it. So you have chronic inflammation. We know chronic inflammation isn't good. Look from 152 when you learned about um, esophagitis and people that get EGDs for GERD that they get esophagitis and they want to monitor it, that inflammation that it causes. Some people won't go to a doctor, won't have an EGD, don't want any of that. So they pop Rolaids, you know, 20 Rolaids a day. What is this doing? It's a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. It doesn't help. You still have the chronic inflammation. And over time, that will become Barrett's esophagus. You learned about that in 152. It becomes a change in cellular function. And it's precursing to cancer. So here, someone who has chronic hepatitis has this long-term inflammatory process, whether they're aware of it or not. And it's damaging all these little cells and causing all this inflammation. Eventually the inflammation is gonna cause you scar tissue and fibrosis. If you end up with a fibrotic um, liver, you have cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is irreversible. And by now you have liver dysfunction, surely. You have portal hypertension. So remember I talked about that portal system coming from all those abdominal organs to come back through the liver and get cleansed. All that blood is collecting, but now you have torturous veins and vessels and arterioles and sinusoids and all these things. And the blood comes rushing back up to this liver and it can't get through so well. So all that congestion creates what's called a portal hypertension. From that chronic inflammation also, you can get liver cancer because over time you will have a change in cellular function 
and you end up with liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, so not a good thing. You have one liver, you need to take care of it. So what else happens? In the early phases, you have um, this antigen antibody complex that activates your complement system. So what is your complement system really? Again, this is micro, just you know, try and think back. It's, it's something that complements your immune system. That's why they gave it the name. You have this reaction where the body's helping however it can to say, let's help. Something's here. The cytokines are sending out, we're trying to kill it. You know, it's still here. What are we doing about it? So anything that can support the immune function, support the phagocytes inside the sinusoids, support anything trying to get rid of this thing that's in you is working, is trying. So the antigen is foreign and the antibodies, if you have them, come out and, you know, if you have an immune system, something functioning, come out and try and neutralize it. And in doing that, maybe it's a little haywire. You might get rash, you might get angioedema. You remember angioedema, you get a swollen dermis, you get subcutaneous tissue that gets full of vascular leakage. You know, the body's trying everything and it's kind of frenetic. Some people get um, a low grade fever, they get joint aches, they feel lousy. You know, your body's working on the inside. You can't see the efforts, but you feel it. You're like, look, you know, I felt terrible yesterday. I felt terrible two days ago. I'm better today. And what helps? What do we say helps people? Rest, because when you rest, your body restores. Nutrition, because if you're giving it food, it's gonna help you get better. People have to have nutrition to get better. A lot of illnesses you don't wanna eat when you're sick. You know, you're just, blah, it's the last thing that's interested, that you're interested in. And hepatitis is one of those. One of the biggest problems we have with liver patients is the severe anorexia they have. They have no interest in food whatsoever. And we have to get them to eat. We have to give them nutrition. All right, so you, we see the presence of cryoglobins in people. These are abnormal proteins. And they're called cryoglobins because on a separate issue, they don't do well in cold temperatures. They don't, they don't um, you know, uh, break down. We can't do anything with them. You know, it's just like cryogenics. They say, oh, let's freeze you and we'll wake you up in 40 years and you'll be fine again. You'll, you'll be 20 years old again because we froze you at 20. You know, cryogenics is, is a whole nother freezing deal, you know? So, but these are abnormal proteins and we start to see them in the blood. The problem is they get clogged up in the kidney and the glomeruli and you get kidney problems. They can get clogged up anywhere. So that doesn't help. So as part of your immune reaction and your complement system, everything's aimed at helping. Sometimes it doesn't help that much. You know, it can, it can cross over and create more issues. All right, so what happens? In an acute phase, it's usually maximum infectivity. So many people are asymptomatic in this phase. That's the problem. They're anorexic. That is like across the board with hepatitis. But other than that, so you don't have an appetite, do you necessarily think you're sick? You know, people, outside people are not thinking, oh my God, it must be hepatitis. I must have one of the A through E's. I better go to the doctor. They're not thinking that. People in 202, maybe. You know how you're in class and you think everything you learn about you have, you know. But people on the outside, not so much. So no one's thinking that. They'd be lethargic. Flu-like symptoms are so nebulous, so nebulous. Maybe there's a flu. Maybe there's a, you know, a 24 or 48 hour thing. Maybe you have some kind of virus, you know, and we don't know how to explain something. What does the doctor always tell you? It's probably viral, you know. It's a big umbrella, a lot of things under there. But maybe skin rashes bring them, maybe the arthralgia. If they have tenderness in the upper quadrant, that usually brings them to a doctor. Now, mind you, most people think it's gallbladder, and it could be, but it can also be liver. Uh, what else? A decreased sense of smell. Interesting. We see that in COVID, too. And what's it related to? It's from the endotoxin. It's, it's what, how the, the virus is reacting when it's in the body. So it's not just COVID we see it in, but clearly it's other viruses as well. But um, it's a hallmark sign. You know, people look for that. Um, an aversion to smoke, an aversion to smells sometimes. Varying degrees of jaundice. You cannot go by jaundice to say someone has hepatitis or not. Jaundice can cause by, be caused by any blockage of bile. So it could be gallbladder, it could be pancreatitis, it could be, it could be a number of things. But some people, you could have 10 people with hepatitis, you don't see jaundice in any of them. 
and then you see another 10 people and six of them have it. I mean, it, it, it's no rhyme or reason. Uh, it's just, you know, it's something that you note and obviously we're checking bloods. It would be enough if somebody walked into a doctor and they were jaundiced that the doctor would send them for blood work and then from blood work possibly admit them depending on how sick they are. So most viral hepatitis cases will recover. And that's something even healthcare people don't think about because when we see hepatitis in the hospital, you're sick enough to be admitted, you're pretty sick. And so if you had a hepatitis patient, I used to take a lot of liver patients when I had students in clinical because there's so much to learn from them systemically that you know, when they see them, they're so sick. And they would say to me, oh my gosh, I hope I never get hepatitis. And I thought, little do they know really that a lot of people just don't even know they have it and they recover from it. So the mortality rate's only 1% really. That should tell you, right? Fading of jaundice, just like presence of jaundice, doesn't always tell you. It's more important that we're tracking people's labs and we're watching their LFTs come down than it is we're saying, oh, they're less jaundice today. They must be getting better. That doesn't pan out. All right, so what do you see in the chronic phase? Well, transaminitis, what does that mean? That means your LFTs are up, right? Your, your liver function tests. And you, you know, they typically draw your ALT and your AST and your GGT, and they're just looking at them and you know, just see which way they go. ALT is usually one of the ones to rise the first, you know, the um, alanine transaminase. But it's not always. Sometimes the first time they have blood drawn, they're all elevated. So um, what else? You have hepatomegaly. By a chronic phase, it's enlarged. So when you're assessing somebody, that liver will rise above the rim of the rib cage. Even when they're laying down, it's above the rib. You should, even in a heavier person, you should be able to feel the edge of the rib cage and push your fingers under it. And in these liver people, your fingers will go up because it's got to go over the liver. So it's enlarged. Um, anemia, Look, go back to the components and the functions. When, once you have hepatitis, you have, you know, you're not able to synthesize your vitamins, you're not able to uh, store your ferritin, your ferritin is not able to link up with um, myoglobin to make hemoglobin, so you have anemia. You, um, asterisis, this is in the end stages. Who remembers what asterisis is? Any brave soul out there? It's called liver flap. What you do is you have the patient hold their hands out and they can't control their hands. Their hands will just flap. And it's a late stage because we see it in cirrhosis because uh, it's, an, it's an indication that now the toxins in the body are affecting the nervous system. It's your entry into nerv nervous system involvement of liver disease. So you have hyperbilirubinemia, can't break down red blood cells, um, the hepatomegaly, it's enlarged, encephalopathy. If your deamination process in your colon, you know, you're breaking down proteins to ammonia and the ammonia is coming to your liver and it's the liver's turn to convert it to urea so you can pee it out and the liver is sick, it's not gonna convert it. Now you have high levels of ammonia in the body. And when that blood that's full of ammonia gets to the brain, the patient is encephalopathic. So they're confused, they could be obtunded, they could be in a coma. They could just be have erratic behavior. So we will be tracking those ammonia levels and we treat them with meds to bind the ammonia and take it out of the body. Uh, they'll have ascites, you know, and we'll talk about this more down the road. Their abdomen gets huge. They start trapping fluid in the peritoneal space. This is because your liver has a shrink wrap around it. You may remember from anatomy, it's called a glisten capsule. But when you're, all this inflammation is going on in your liver and you don't have albumin, you cannot keep fluid in your vascular space and it seeps out. You lose your oncotic pressure and it seeps out. Well, where's it going to go? It goes through that shrink wrap and the only space around it is your peritoneal space. So you start collecting all the societies in your abdomen. Uh, they're fatigued. If you have ever taken care of somebody with liver disease, they have no energy stores at all. Part of it is their malnutrition because they're anorexic. Part of it is cellular malnutrition. So they are just weak, weak, weak. So there's a lot for students to do working on a liver patient. They're, they need a lot, a lot of care. And they'll have general malaise, just blah. They feel horrible. 
it can be very, very slow in its development. Of all of them, hepatitis C has the greatest risk of being the chronic one. All right, so let's talk hep A. This one is not as bad, and this is kind of what I was referring to when I said, who knows, we might have had it and not known. So this is an RNA virus, and the only reason we say RNA versus DNA, they're all RNA except B. B is your only DNA virus. It helps us know how to treat it. You know, viruses are not like um, most living things. They don't have their own cell and everything in it. They're like strands of protein, and they have a capsule, but an RNA virus replicates in the cytoplasm. A DNA replicates in, from the nucleus. So it's just like now, COVID is an RNA. So when I saw on TV, people are talking about, well, if they give you the vaccine, it changes the DNA. It's an RNA virus. So the way it's attacked is through the cytoplasm. It doesn't even go near the nucleus. And I'm sure there's people out there trying to get that point across to people, but you see how it's just lack of knowledge. They just don't know. They haven't had the micro you've had. So it's an RNA virus. So if we're gonna attack, if we, we needed meds for this, let's say, and we had to come up with a drug, no sense getting a drug that's gonna affect the virus on the DNA level in the nucleus. It's not gonna work for an RNA virus. So that's the reason it's differentiated for treatment. Okay, so how is it transmitted? It's an easy one, it's fecal oral route. Gross, right? But it's easy. So poor food handling. Why do you think every place you go to eat has all the OSHA signs, all the signs all over the place? You go in the bathrooms at a restaurant, what does it say on the mirror? All employees must hand wash before returning to serve food. These are laws because we know if someone has terrible bathroom habits, gross, and goes into the bathroom and poos and doesn't wash their hands and comes out and handles your food, if they have hepatitis, you now have hepatitis. So, that's why there's health laws about this. Similarly, any place where there's crowded living conditions, you know, halfway homes or places, the halfway homes that care for the mentally ill, where these poor depressed people can't do their self-care. We know this about them. The space their mind is in is they're, they're so depressed, they have no energy to even comb their hair and brush their teeth and all of that. This is an area that would need some direction. You need someone in the house saying, have you washed your hands before you eat it? Have you done crowded living conditions, prisons, you know, um, long-term care facilities, um, your own daycares, if you have kids in daycare, they should be really, really careful about this. They handle your kids' lunches and snacks and toilet them and then toilet other children. So these are things that are just really important. Family members of people who have hepatitis need to be careful. You know, you're living in the same house, sharing the same bathroom, whatever. So what we know about it is it's detectable in the stool two weeks before symptoms. Well, that's great. Who goes around checking stool when you're perfectly healthy? Nobody. So it's a factoid, but it doesn't help us. And until one week after jaundice appears, some hep A's might not have jaundice. They might not. So that's not a helpful marker either. So what's the answer? Look at the symptoms, look at these things and think about the prevention. So the symptoms can be flu-like, you know, you felt lousy for a couple of days, you went to bed and rested, you feel better today. Like I said before, you're not thinking, oh my God, I have hep A. You're not thinking that. You might have, but you're not thinking that. It can be all the way to acute hepatitis, your jaundice, you wake up and you're yellow, scared to death, go to the doctor and he puts you in the hospital because they want to keep an eye on you. So. All of this can be A. Now, diagnostics, what do we have? We do have tests for antibodies. So we can draw an antibody HAVM and an antibody HAV IgG, and it will tell us something. You have to think when it goes back to your gamma globulins you learned about in, I don't know, probably both classes, A and P and micro maybe, but go back to your, your gamma globulins. You have to think as M as your medic, you know? They're not large in number, they're the first to arrive on the scene. So something happens to you, boom, IgM is out there. So if we have a test to test for that, if we draw an antibody test and it shows us you have IgM, we know you're in the acute phase because the first responders are there. That's what we're picking up in the blood. If you have antibodies to IgG, IgG comes after IgM. This is global. 
These are globins that are in every fluid in the body. They're everywhere, smaller, but larger in number. So if we draw antibodies and we see IgG is there, then we know you either have had the infection because M has come in and cleared out, or have you been inoculated? Maybe one of these people, and, and if they haven't asked you, they'll say, where do you work? And if you say, oh, I work in the prison, I work in daycare, I work in a commercial kitchen, I work someplace where they may have told you to be vaccinated. So, you know, it gives us clues, but those are the only tests we have for this. And it's fine, we don't see that much of it, thank God, because we have health rules that say you gotta wash your hands. And we have strict codes of sanitation in restaurants, which, so you gotta pay a little more attention to the guy on the news that does the, oh, let's look at the food score report, you know, so-and-so showing up with a C now. Yeah, stay away from the C place. Not a good place to go. Okay, the B isn't so great either. You can get a higher number than that. Find a different place. So there's no specific treatment. They manage it at home. Like I said, most people don't even know they've had it. You could have felt that malaise a couple of days in your life and just thought it was nothing. So you just don't know. And people will recover, usually. Think of somebody though who's comorbid or someone who's undergoing cancer treatment, or that could change the game completely for them, completely. All right, so what do you Jane. do? Yes. Oh, sorry. No, um, you're fine. So with, um, with hepatitis A, since you could like recover from it with potentially no issues, is right. there a way to know if you've had it before? Like, will it always show up on a test or will it yeah. not? If they do the antibody test, they'll tell you have antibodies to it. It's like people who have been around COVID a lot now and haven't been positive, have no symptoms. Every once in a while in healthcare systems, you know, my son's an anesthesia resident in Chicago and anesthesia, all they're doing is tubing. They're on an airway team and they're putting everyone on vents with COVID, unfortunately. So after so long, they said to all of them, who here has not ever had a test and been shown positive? And, the, and now mind you, they're in PAPR outfits. You know, they have the ventilation hoods and all that. They walk around in moon suits all day. But, you know, they said, we want to draw your antibodies because maybe you have had one of those cases that was just, and we don't know. So they draw the antibody test and even they don't have it. So they, as many times as they've been exposed, they've also been protected, which gives a good shout out to PPE, you know, but yeah. So yeah, if they draw the, the antibodies and you have them, then they'll know you had it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what do you do? You're the nurse. We focus on prevention and control. So there are vaccines out there for HAV for people who work in these high risk environments. And it's a dead virus. You know about dead viruses, right? So you cannot get Hep A from the Hep A vaccine. Now you will find the more you're in nursing, there's a lot of misconception in the public. Because unlike you who has had a microbiology class and understands these things now, the average outside person does not. I can't tell you how many times when I had my company, I used to volunteer to give back to the community and go do flu shots and all these things. I can't tell you how many people said, no, I don't get the flu shot, I get the flu from the flu shot. It's physically impossible. It is a dead virus. You probably all know somebody in your life who claims to get the flu every time they get the flu shot. It's not the flu they get. Do they get sick? Maybe, you know, maybe, who knows? But it is not the flu. It's physically impossible to give somebody the flu from the flu shot. It's a dead virus. Now, if you're going with a spray up the nose, that's a different story. That's a live attenuated viruses. And you know about those too. They're weakened, but they're live. So people like to give those to their kids, not to make their children have a a needle that hurts for two seconds, and then their kid comes down with the flu, and they're like, how did this happen? You took the nasal spray. Think about this. So when you're talking to people in this community or people at risk for this, you have to realize that they probably think, like all the other outside people, that they're going to get sick from it. They can't get sick. If you get a response that your immune system is mounting, that's a different story. That's usually transient, 24 hours, 12 hours, whatever. I had both my COVID um, shots and I had the first one, I had nothing. The next morning, I swear to you, I rubbed my arm. I couldn't even feel where the needle, you know, you can usually feel the spot, couldn't even feel where the needle went in. So I thought, wow, not only should you give a good shot, but good vaccine, didn't bother me. I had the other one, I don't know, a week or so ago and nothing. 
absolutely nothing. Not a fever, not a sniffle, nothing. So I don't know, somebody else, their immune system's different. And maybe they feel yucky for 12 hours. Maybe somebody else feels, you know, oh my God, I'm shaking. And it might, one of the girls my son works with, <coughs> pardon me, he said they were working in the MICU and she almost had rigor. She was shaking so bad. So everybody's different. But a mounting, a, an immune response that's mounted quickly from a vaccination is one of those 12, 24 hour things, you know? But they're not going to get hepatitis A from taking Havrix or, you know, Vacta or any of those. Um, IgG can be given if you have a suspected exposure. So a couple of years ago, Cowfish, I think it was usually this restaurant on um, Sharon Road, Cowfish was constantly getting shut down every other month. And you know, they didn't lose clientele. I never understood it. Um, but they were closed down. Most times, I think it was Shigella that closed it down, but I think twice it was closed for Hep A. And it would close down, they disinfect the whole place, open up the next month, packed with people, spilling out onto the streets, closed down again. A month later, blah, blah, blah. And the next time the health department made them shut down, change employees, go through training, they were shut down for months, go through all of that deal, open up again, they were shut down in a month for another outbreak of something. So it's not just, you can't put the things in place, you have to have people police what people are doing to make sure they're being compliant. But anyway, if you hear in the news, there was a place on Central Ave that people, there was an outbreak that they knew workers had Hep A, some, some people had gone to the health department with complaints. I think it was not last summer, probably summer before, and they told people, go to the health department and they'll get IgG. So they give them that just to help boost the immune system a little bit. So vaccination and hand washing, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. You know, Jamie and I are old school. We wash hands for everything. I mean, pumps are nice if it's all there is, but hand wash, I need hot water and soap. Okay, let's look at hepatitis B. B. So this is your only DNA virus. And this one, I think you do an ACE module on this, don't you? So you should be pretty familiar with this one. This one is also called serum hepatitis. They're trying to get away from that name, but it was called that for 100 years. So trying to change the name in people's minds is, you know. Anyway, it is called serum hepatitis because it's bloodborne. This is your bloodborne pathogen. So how is it transmitted? The way bloodborne pathogens are transmitted, infected blood, body fluids, and somebody who is not vaccinated. Perinatal mothers um, can give it. Um, pardon me, IV drug users, um, use of needles if you're not careful, people who go get tattoos. And every time I used to say that in a ground-based class, everyone in the class with a tattoo was like, oh, I hope it wasn't my place, you know, type of thing. Because at the time they wanted it, the place looked okay. You know? <laughs> and so then they think, what should I have been looking for when I haven't put all this ink all over me? Um, so tattoos can do it, piercings, you know, anytime people are exposing uh, whatever utensils they have or whatever to your blood and body fluids. Um, sex is the big one. Sex with infected people, infected semen, infected saliva. And so one student said to me one time, well, if I'm out there, like, what should I be doing? Say, have you been tested for hep B? <laughs> I, those are those conversations you have to deal with in your own private time. But you have to think about that. You know, so GI bleeds, people don't think about it, taking care of a GI bleed. If somebody has hep B and they're bleeding all over you, be careful. And they're like, well, I just wanted to quick grab the bedpan. I didn't have a glove. You don't quick grab the bedpan when you don't have a glove. Put your gloves on. We have learned, and it was a hard lesson for my generation. We have learned since the outbreak of AIDS, standard precautions, keep your gloves on because you treat everyone as though they're infected. And I had come through nursing school, we were written up if we put a gloved hand on a patient. So you couldn't treat people like cooties. So it was ingrained in people of my era going to school that you never put a gloved hand on anybody. And now when we know better, we do better. And now we do the total opposite. So um, yeah, it's crazy. Organ donation can be a, pop, a, a possible source. So they screen the donor because think about it, the recipient is gonna be instantly immunosuppressed when they get this organ. 
And by doing that, you know, you're, you're just going to let her ravage them because they won't have an immune system and they'll have this disease. Okay. Uh, risk and incubation. So who's at risk? Well, hemodialysis patients, maybe not so much any, you know, I won't say not so much anymore. I'll say less than it used to be because historically not that long ago when you had hemodialysis, they took all that industrial tubing and cleaned it. They autoclaved it and cleaned it and used it for the next person. Gross, just the thought. I can't believe medicine ever did that. But they didn't know about these things at the time. So now all that tubing is chuckable and they take it down and it's fresh everything. But we're in and out of people's blood so much that if they're getting hep B, not from dialysis, but from their partner or from somebody else in their life, and now they're coming to dialysis and we don't know they have it, then you're at risk if you're taking care of them and you don't watch your PPE. So be careful. Healthcare workers in general, public safety personnel, you know, your medics always show up with gloves on. Your police always have gloves, put gloves on before they go to a scene where someone's bleeding or vomiting or something. You know, um, you gotta be careful of that. It lives on dry surfaces seven days. So it's not one that's easily killed like that. You have to be careful. Incubation, before and after symptoms, it's in the blood test, but preemptively, we're not just having random hepatitis bloods drawn. There's no evidence that it's tears and sweat or urine or breast milk. We've had students in preceptorship sprayed in the eye with um, breast milk and in a uh, hepatitis positive mom. And we've called epidemiology and they were like, well, let us verify. Hello, hello, is this epidemiology? <laughs> like, you, who are you calling? I mean, I'm looking on a CDC site to verify who are you calling? So um, there is no evidence that it's spread in breast milk. Uh, you're infectious four to six months after the start of symptoms. So if all you felt was blah, today I feel malaise-like, and that's the extent of your symptoms of this, do you know you're still positive? that you could still be giving it to somebody? No, which brings me back to my students saying, if I'm out there, what kind of conversation do I have with people? How much risk do you feel at HB or having HB and not thinking much of it? I mean, I wouldn't want it. Someone who's a carrier, who's determined to be a carrier, will be a carrier for life. So you gotta be careful, you know, it's, it's um, serious, which is why it's such a big thing in the hospital and everyone does the module on it. All right, so what are our diagnostics? So you're looking at this and saying, oh, what do we need to know? Okay, here's the good news. It comes in a panel. So if your patient is being screened for HBV, the doctor will order an HBV panel, and you'll say, okay, that must mean they're either ruling out or they suspect or whatever, HBV. But the different components, just because it's theory and you have to be exposed to it, the surface antigen, we can pick HBV up several places on, on a cell. So the surface antigen tells us you are in an acute phase. You know, if it's on the surface, um, we know that that's an acute phase. So what happens if we, if we find it and it's the first time you've had this blood work and we're getting a positive result for your surface antigen, then we're saying, okay, if your doctor's tracking you down the road and six months later, it's still present as a surface antigen, then they're going to tell you you're a chronic carrier, a chronic carrier. If your core antigen is what we determine, it's now off the surface and into the core. So now we're saying you have an acute viral infection and they're going to start treating you with whatever we have. We'll go over some options. And if it's an E antigen, they're tracking it just to see about replication and infectivity. So what they're looking at with the E is, we've started giving you therapy. What is your E telling us? Is it getting less? Is it going away? Or are you not responsive to therapy? So it just gives them a clue about, you know, which way to go with your treatment now that we have a couple of options. They can also track HBV DNA. This is telling them about replication and effectiveness of therapy also. So it's just another thing they're drawing. It's not telling you your nursing care is changing any different. You wanna know, is the surface antigen positive or negative? Is this person acute right now or maybe a carrier? 
Your antennas should be up when they're drawing HPV panels until you get a negative. And you should be prepared. Any patient you have could be HPV and you have gloves taking care of them. You're gonna use standard precautions, okay? If they have you know, diarrhea or something, you're gonna put a gown or something on, protect yourself like anybody else. But your you know, gloves, you have to have your standard precautions. Okay, the other thing we're doing is genotyping. So it tells you how long HPV has been around, that it's developed various strains, and now we can genotype it, really. The good thing about genotype, it's not from our perspective really, but the good thing about genotyping is it's, it's gonna direct us certain ways. If you have this genotype, they're gonna order this kind of treatment better than another one. And so it just helps doctors that way, not so much from our standpoint. All right, so antibody testing. We can draw antibodies also. So are we gonna find you have antibodies to the S? Maybe, that means you're immune. Either you had a vaccine and you're immune, or you had the disease and you're now immune. So that's a good thing. HBE antibodies tells us you've had a previous infection. So those are the things it's, it's telling us. The antibodies to IgG could mean you've had a previous infection or maybe it's ongoing. It doesn't give us a timeline. It doesn't say, it tells us you've been exposed and you've had it, but is it still ongoing? That's why we'd go to the S to see. Um, the IgM, it's acute. Remember, these are the people that come first responders. So if you still have antibodies to IgM and they're on the scene at all, it's, it's acute. Now, you're not gonna find IgG and IgM in someone who's been vaccinated because they've, we've given you defense of the disease. So you haven't had it, the disease, to elicit the IgM, IgG response. That's what that is. All right, what else? Prognosis, again, most people recover. I don't think we see that with all the commercials we see. And you know, if you've seen patients with this, I don't think we think that. If not, the liver can range from being functional all the way to being so severely inflamed, you're gonna end up with cirrhosis. There's such a panacea of how people are gonna to react to this. About 15 to 25%, Lewis tells us, will have chronic HBV and die. So chronic liver disease, probably a change in cellular function from chronic inflammation, and they'll have hepatocellular carcinoma. So what's our treatment? Well, it's only treated for severe hepatitis and failure. We're trying to decrease the viral load. We're trying to reduce transaminitis, get your lab values down, slow the progression of disease. There is no cure. Right now, it doesn't kill the virus. We're trying to suppress replication, prevent complications, get the inflammation under control, do what we can so it doesn't progress further. That's the best we can do. You gotta hope you're one that just gets over it, you know? So what do we use to do this? And I'll give you a break. What do we use? Well, first line therapy is nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. What does this mean to you? Well, you've heard about them. This is Hepsera, you know, um, uh, what else? Baraclude. I mean, there's some that are commercials on them. You might've had them in another class. They decrease replication because we know where to find the HBV. It goes into the DNA and kills it. It's trying to get rid of it and diminish the numbers. Now we can't exclude it from you altogether. Somewhere or other, it's gonna keep replicating, but can we control it? Can we kill enough of it or suppress enough of it to keep it under control? The goal is to decrease the damage, stop the inflammation as best we can. They're oral meds. It is long, 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 long-term medication. And when you have something like that, people get sick of taking it and they stop. If they stop taking their meds, they will exacerbate possibly in a worse position than where they were to begin with. You have to teach compliance. If there's a problem they have with the drug, let them tell us what it is and see what we can do to address the symptom. So there's also interferon. And this is the one, I mean, they use more uh, of the um, nucleotides and nucleosides now, but interferon was all we had for years. So 
you have interferon, your body makes it naturally. Now we found a way to synthesize it, you know, and give it to you exogenously. And it blocks viral entry into the cell, which is good. It's going to block the synthesis, block the, you know, when it's trying to put it together and construct it, it interferes with that. So it works well. You know, your body had it, but not enough to fight it, or it just pooped out after a while. So you'll see it as um, pegas peg, um, Pegasus is still around. Um, what's the other one they had? It's not that Pegantron. There's another peg. And you'll find that peg is, it's pegylated. And you'll find that peg is always the, the start of the word. Peg is in everything. And the reason is this pegylated, there's no big mystery to it. It's just the chain of glycol. It's the way it's constructed this med. But what it does do is preserve the bioavailability of the interferon. It doesn't let the immune system use it and then break it down as quickly. So it's more bioavailable in the body for a long time, which is why it's not just interferon we give, it's pegylated. That's why. And what they'll do is do frequent, frequent labs. So if they're non-compliant with labs, we don't know where the treatment's going. And they screen them a lot for depression because they're so sick of being sick and having to take this drug and having to make sure they get their doses in and all, they get really depressed over this. When it hits them, they have it and they can't get rid of it. It's impactful to people. So really prevention is the best thing. All right, why don't you take a break and come back on the hour and I'll do this and we'll get into the rest of it, okay? All right, so from a nursing standpoint, what do we do? You're the nurse, what are you doing? Know who your at-risk population people are. Promote screening and vaccinating, that would help. The vaccine, it's Recombivax, it's a series of three, very effective. People don't like taking it because they, the, the studies show that they take one, they don't wanna go back and take two more, they take two, they don't get the third. And if it, a long enough time passes, they'll make them start over again. So they have to be compliant with that and just get them all done. Children are routinely vaccinated, but obviously our populace of people that work in this environment that puts them at risk would need to be too. So post-exposure, post what do they do? Well, they may say to you, take the vaccine anyway. Sometimes they do, depends on when you think the exposure was, how close you think it was to your reporting it, and whether or not it was actual exposure or just fear of exposure. They can also give you the HBIG. This is HB immunoglobin. And they make this from people who have had HB and then they formulate um, a globin to give someone else protection. You'll remember in the early stages of uh, COVID, they were saying the same thing. We should go to people who have had it so we can extrapolate and make an immunoglobin for somebody else. There's so many you know, um, varied degrees that people get this disease, it's not, just like COVID, it's not, uh, it's hard to predict. So that's still in planning. There's nothing out yet, but um, for HPV, we have it. So they say the best is within 24 hours. Do people always know they've been exposed within 24 hours? No, typically not till they become symptomatic. So um, standard precautions, do not share personal items. Teach your kids that, your patients that. It's it seems such a basic thing, but you really can't share personal items with people. You, you just don't know who has it. Um, safe sex practices can you know, save your life, at least save you from HPV, among other things. So, and for healthcare professionals, years ago, they implemented do not recap a needle. Do not recap a needle. Uh, you still catch somebody every now and again, don't recap a needle. Okay, um, let me advance my slide. All right, so hep C. What are we looking at, hep C? This is an RNA virus, so we're back to our RNAs. How is it transmitted? This is percutaneous, um, high-risk sex with infected partners, uh, blood and blood products. You know, it sounds some like HPV, but it's not. This one can be chronic. It's more your uh, drug users. A lot of people with HCV also have AIDS. So that just compounds their situation, but the same behaviors 
that can give you one can give you the other. Um, they say only about 10% of that is occupational. I don't even know if it's that much anymore because everything we have is disposable. We reuse nothing, especially in dialysis, which was a big source of these contaminations. Um, perinatal always exists. You just never know who you're gonna have. And sometimes at Maine, on L and D, if you were up there, you know they sometimes get people they've never seen before until the day of delivery, so they have no history on them whatsoever. Anyone who has had a transfusion before 1992 is at risk, and this is because we did not screen blood for HCV until 1992. So, and the thing with HCV is people get it and they can hold it 20, 25 years before they become symptomatic. So they have no idea most times where it came from. They can't remember back to what they did when they were young. So somebody who's had a blood transfusion prior to 1992 could very well have gotten it then, and it's just been sitting there. So HCV is sneaky that way. Okay, let's see. So what else? Well, it's the most common indication of liver transplantation in the U.S., and they don't always do well, actually, because you're transplanting them. The whole body's been exposed to HCV, although it's affecting mainly the liver. But you give them a new liver, and then you immunosuppress them, and it can just fulminate again. So a lot of times they put them back on therapy. It just depends on the patient. Um, many, many, many will never know their source. And on average, they say 10 to 20 years since you've been inoculated. Could have been longer than that. We've had people that say, the only time, one time I did IV drugs, I was 18 years old, you know, with my friends someplace, you know, whatever in the service, whatever they did. And now they're 62 and they wonder, you're really thinking it could be that? You know, um, some people look back and say, God, every summer I was at Myrtle Beach. I don't know, what year did I have a tattoo? What year did I, you know, this and that? They don't remember. You know, all the people they'd been with all the years, they weren't taking a poll asking who had HCV. And so, you know, they just a lot of times won't know their source. And yet all of a sudden it's diagnosed and they're really sick, really sick. So it lies dormant there and it's working chronically as an infection, wearing down the liver. So 80% of the hepatocellular carcinoma cases are HBV and HCV. The others are probably autoimmune hepatitis. But it's because of that chronic inflammation that you have a change in cellular function and they become cancerous. Um, and I, I told you how the, a lot of HCV will also have HIV, which is going to impact them dramatically because they lack an immune system response. So what else? Incubation, one to two weeks before symptoms appear. Nice to know, but you know what? If we're not symptomatic, we're not looking to see if we've gotten it, right? Uh, it continues all through the clinical course that you're incubating. People, a, a lot of them will develop it chronically and remain infectious on and on and on. So initially, usually asymptomatic like our other hepatitises. You know, maybe you don't feel anything. Might be mild. How does somebody get it when they're 18 at the beach one summer and doesn't feel it till they're 45? I mean, it's, it's just innocuous that way. Many, many people will be unaware and unfortunately will become chronic. In the end, they're going to start seeing hepatomegaly. You know, the liver's sick enough now, inflamed enough that it's getting all bumpy and nodule. Um, that will affect when your liver is under duress. It pushes back on all that portal flow. In doing that, that portal hypertension causes splenomegaly. It causes your spleen to enlarge that starts replicating its job, it starts going faster. So it's depleting your cells. So people end up with more uh, issues from that, but you have all this tenderness, they just feel blah. You know, it's really, it's very sad to see and to watch people try and figure out where they would have gotten it from. All right, so how do we diagnose it? We can do antibodies to HCV, we have that test. So we can check that and it's gonna be a marker of, um, acute or chronic infection. Maybe you have it now, maybe you don't. It's limited, but that's what we have for, we have an antibody to HCV. Unless we track it, we won't know if it's a spike or it's a continuum. Um, the RNA quantitation, we can do that. That helps us know about viral replication. That helps some in treatment. Doesn't help us beforehand, but it helps us with treatment to say, we're giving you this. 
how's the replication going? Is it less? Um, we have genotyping and C is worse than B. So it's been around longer. And what we have is at least six genotypes. I think it's a little more now in the more updated literature, but at least 50 subtypes off of that. So the more people have it and give it to people and you know, you're sharing it with someone and they give it to someone else, it's gonna vary, it's gonna mutate going forward. So we have all these genotypes and subgenotypes. A liver biopsy can be done. That's a great way to find out more about your liver. But think of your liver patient who's chronic now and probably has advanced liver disease. Do we clot? Not so much. Are they anemic? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have all the things that we said the liver does for a living that now it's not doing. So to put a, a core biopsy instrument into the liver and take a chunk of liver out that is so vascular in someone who has limited clotting ability is pretty dangerous. So they can't always do a liver biopsy. Uh, Non-invasively, we can do a fiber scan. This is an ultrasound they can do that's been adapted specifically for liver tissue. And it lets them have an idea of the inflammation and fibrosis that they see. Uh, we can do a fiber shore test. It uses liver function tests and a formulaic thing. And it kind of gives us a, a range of where we think people are on the spectrum. So there's some things we can use that way. The treatment is aimed at killing the virus and it's aimed at preventing complications. Now the problem is people aren't compliant. So if we could kill this for you, it behooves you to stick with the regimen so that we can do that, but they get sick of taking treatment. And, and again, what puts them at risk? It could be IV drug abuse. So look at your population of people who have this through addiction. They're not gonna keep up with what they're supposed to do because God help them, they can't come off the drugs. So that complicates that case. Also look at the patient who is superimposed with HIV, who has all those meds to take. You know, that makes a more complex case. My battery is running low, sorry. Um, that makes a more complex case, adds another dimension to what we have to deal with with this patient. Plus, they're so sick of being in treatment. Bad enough, they had to deal with an HIV diagnosis. Now they have hep C and they get so depressed, they don't want to do anything. So they need a lot of intervention. We have to assess their situation and what we identify as their priority issues and support that, you know? So the treatment is further dictated by your comorbidities. You know, yes, we have genotyping. So let's look at that. It's going to tell you what, tell us what we think you most respond to. You'll have the best outcomes with, but what else do you have wrong with you? Are you already in kidney failure? Do you have bad heart history? Do you have hypertension and high cholesterol? Do you have diabetes? I mean, what else do you have? This hep C can be found in the person who doesn't remember at 20 what he did, but he's now 62. He probably has other comorbidities by then. So there's other things to deal with, aside from the fact that we have to look at how sick your liver is and what it can handle. If it's real diseased, it can't break anything down. So we go to give you meds. Can you biodegrade them? Can you take them in? put them first past the threat effect through the liver and the liver do anything with them? You know, we don't know. So all of that is in consideration here. So one of the things they use is these direct acting antivirals and they block the protein that it needs to replicate, which was a great breakthrough therapy. Great. Um, complete therapy is about 12 weeks. If you meet all those criteria, notwithstanding all the people I just told you about that probably wouldn't comply or couldn't comply. So it, it, it shows some hope. Protease inhibitors, you hear about these uh, on TV. I know um, Olicio and you, know, you hear the little blurbs about them and everything. And there's people that put hep C kind of out in the public. It was hidden before, but um, Pamela Anderson came forward that she had it from Tommy and you know, it got more exposure and she went into all kinds of therapy and everything for it. So, you know, the protease inhibitors are one of the big ones they use also. This is every eight hours and needs strict compliance. That's three times a day. People don't like that. It, it depends on your ability of your liver to compensate. If you have no liver function, they're not apt to go with that. Um, polymerase inhibitors, this is like your Epclusa. Um, they're going to just 
prevent replication, which that's good. Let's prevent the replication if that's all we can give you. So just remember the patient, it depends on them and their history and what compounds their case. But there is some treatment we can do for them, which is good. We didn't have that years ago. So there's no vaccine, nothing. They keep working on it, believe me, but there's nothing. Um, screening is essential. Blood, organ, tissue donation. I mean, you imagine there was a time when we didn't screen blood for this and just gave people tr blood transfusions. So if we took blood from a donor who had it, we were not realizing we were giving it to how many other people who were using those blood byproducts. So organ donation, donation is carefully screened. Um, tissue donation of any kind. So, and, and baby boomers 45 to 65, born 45 to 65, they think are at the biggest risk because through the predominance of their lifetime, there was not much in place to screen. And when they were probably at their riskiest behaviors. And it brings us back to that whole 60s deal where people were just dropping out, dropping in, whatever the expression was at the time. And you know, taking all the drugs and sharing all the needles and, you know, living in communes and all of that. So it puts them at much bigger risk. Um, infection control precautions, don't forget them. We're not treating people like cooties. We're trying to protect them and you. Uh, they need to modify high-risk behavior. They can't always do that. You try and tell a drug addict they shouldn't be sharing needles. You know, they can't help it. When their craving is there for that heroin or cocaine or whatever it is, they're gonna go for it. So um, there's some of that is very difficult to control. There is no prophylaxis after you've been exposed that has been shown to do anything. And if you are exposed, they say, wow, well, we'll keep drawing your anti-HCV and your ALT levels and just keep drawing them to see what happens. But you know, there's, there's nothing they can do for you at that point. All right. Hey, Jane. Yeah. Um, when it comes to Alicia, um, how strict is that every eight hours? Is like taking is taking it a half hour late one day? Is I mean something like that going to really screw it up? Or you know, in theory, they're always going to say take it every eight hours. It should be part of the patient's compliant routine and this and that. Well, I tell you, in the hospital, it's always given. You guys know yourself how meds are given that you know meds that should be given separate at seven o'clock and not at eight get grouped with eight o'clocks so or they get grouped with nines or whatever um but pharmacologically they say every eight hours because it should be every they want to maintain that blood level now when they give you a drug an antibiotic or something and they say here you're going to take it twice a day because we got to sustain the blood level it usually means the blood level is good for 20 hours and they're gonna tell you twice a day so you take it at 12 so that you have coverage. I'm sure in pharmacologically, if we dug into it, it I'm sure there's more coverage than just, it doesn't, it's not like um, Cinderella, you know, that right at the eighth hour, I think you've lost everything. But if you are educating people and you give them that leeway and you say about eight hours, some days it might be 12, some days it might be, five they're gonna wait a whole day and not take it, you know? So I think there's theory and then there's the educational piece and then there's probably real science and the real science probably gives you an overlapped window, but you give people that leeway and say, it is okay if, you, if you're supposed to take it at eight and you don't take it till 10, 30, it's fine. Then how much more, la you know, you give an inch, you, they take a mile. So I think some of that is that, that they're trying to get people to stay within that window and. It, the point is to maintain the blood level. So I would say as close as they can get to eight hours is good. I have, yeah, I have been at the bedside when doctors have talked to patients about this because, you know, I'm interested. I have to go in and hear what they say. And so, but I go in there and they'll say to the patient, get up in the morning. What time do you get up? And they say nine or they get up at eight. And they say, okay, you get up at eight. Then you set your watch alarm for four and you get up at midnight. You take it and go back to bed you're still allowed eight hours sleep. I mean, that's, well, I get up at nine. Okay, then we're gonna change the times. Nine, then you go to this and you wake up and set your alarm. You wanna get up at one in the morning, then set the alarm at one. So the, the doctors, when they teach it, teach it strictly. But chemically, you know, not that I'm a pharmacist, but I would think that there's probably some availability. There's certain drugs, um, uh, Mestinon or some of them that 
it's it's good for so many hours and that's it. And we set clocks in the unit to give it right on time. You know, there's certain things that you have to give right on time, but I don't know that this is one. I think there'd be more black box warning type of stuff for us. That's my best, you know? Okay, Thank you. yeah. So HDV, you're not gonna mind. HDV is a simple one. It's an RNA virus. It cannot live on its own. The only way HDV exists is if you already have HB. It cannot replicate without HB. It's very symbiotic that way. So it's transmitted the same way HBV is. It's usually contracted along with HBV. So you're only gonna see it in your patients who already have B. Incubation period, you're constantly infectious, but it's not gonna go to somebody who doesn't have B. You know, you just, you, and typically the person giving it to you to have D will already have B, if that makes sense. So if someone is, let's say, spreading it to you, if they have B and already have D, then you could get B and D. But you can't have D by itself. It can't exist. It needs a B. All right, so we have one antibody test. It's the anti-HDV, and it tells us it's present or it's current. So we defer to your HBV test. If you have HBV, however long you've had it, we assume that's how long you've had D. You could have picked it up later, but we assume. HDV, AG, this is your antigen. A few days after you think you're exposed, um, after the initial infection, we can usually pick up the antigen. There's no vaccine. Having the HB vaccine will prevent you from getting B, which will mean you can't have D but there's no vaccine for D. There's no treatment for D. If you have it, you have B, we treat B. Um, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple one. Um, people infected with HBV are always at risk, always. So you look to your B more than your D. And HEV, this is an easy one too. It's gonna look in a lot of ways like A, but the big difference is this is out of our country. So E, it's an RNA, it's fecal oral root, gross. Um, it's usually contaminated drinking water, which thank God in this country is not, even in the poorest areas, is not as big a problem as it is other places. Um, it's very common in developing countries or in third world places. So you can have it in India, Mexico, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, um, you know, any place where they wouldn't have indoor plumbing or it's just so rural that there's nothing to, um, purify the water. So HEV, that's where that comes from. Cases in the U.S., if you get somebody sick enough, A, to have it, to be in the hospital with it, it's probably someone in your interview that by history they're saying it's E because they've just come from living six months in India or six months somewhere else or a mission trip somewhere or something. And uh, that's usually the big piece. So incubation, up to two months after inoculation with it. So they can spread it to people, come back from that mission trip, not feel good, they could give it to others. Um, they're not clinically distinguishable from other types of virus. And we don't have FDA approved tests in this country for it because it's not something we see. It's not endemic to us. So it usually resolves on its own if someone is sick enough to have to be in the hospital and they suspect it's HEV, then they treat them as symptoms dictate. Um, rest, nutrition, no alcohol, you know, simple stuff. Other sources, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, we touched on these, uh, herpes. You don't think of someone having that kind of viral infection and, you know, ending up with hepatitis, really sick with it, but they can. All right, so what can happen? Well, most recover, we've talked about that. Complications can be acute liver failure you might be the one that's not gonna recover because you have other comorbidities or you're just that vulnerable or you've been on chemotherapy and your immune system is not what it is. You've had a transplant prior and you live on immunosuppressive drugs. You have autoimmune diseases and you take immunosuppressive drugs. So you may react differently to this, right? If it becomes chronic, you're at risk for cirrhosis. Once you have fibrosis, you have cirrhosis and you can have hepatocellular carcinoma. Fading jaundice, remember, is not an indication of disease resolution. 
We're looking at labs. We need your ALT, your AST, GGT, all that to come down. And the ones most likely to be chronic are B and C. All right, so let's look at some drugs and chemical. So alcohol is a common cause. It's not the only cause of cirrhosis. And there are still people out there. I've heard nurses on the floor say, oh, cirrhosis, long time drinker. Well, no, it's not anything to do with drinking. You know, that's really such a hard thing for people to get away from. It can be alcohol, but it's not always. So they can have with alcohol acute hepatitis. Some people go on a binge and have acute hepatitis and are in the hospital from it because they've had an acute episode from drinking and drinking and drinking. I had a student one time in preceptorship. It was a very odd placement. They asked us to try the freestanding ED in South Park. And could we place one of our ED people there? So I said, well, how many cases do you have? Because at the time it was a pretty sleepy place and I don't want students going where they're not gonna see things, you know? So they said, no, no, no. So I went over there and I saw how many cases came in and whatnot. I said, well, we'll try somebody over here. If it's not good, I'll pull her and stick her in Maine or at Mercy or someplace in the ED. So I was trying to help the system want to expand us to these other facilities. I was trying. So we send her out there. And the first case she sees is this 14 year old girl, two of them neighborhood friends, you know, 14. One told her parents she was going to be over the other one's house. The other one told the parents they were going to be at the other house, of course. And they're great friends and they're six houses apart. And the parents never checked because the two were like Siamese twins are always together. And they were over one child's house whose parents weren't home. And they went into the liquor closet thinking they'd have this weekend of drinking. And this 14 year old comes in with acute hepatitis from drinking all this alcohol. Her friend found her unconscious on the floor. Her friend was in vomiting, vomiting. So she didn't know where the girl was came out and found her unconscious, called the ambulance. They brought her in. This girl died an hour and a half later from acute hepatitis. So, you know, it's, it's um, alcohol can definitely cause you long-term liver disease. Some people get super sick the first time they do it, or if they drink too much, they know it and they slow down and get away from it. Other people will do it all their lives. Some people, you know, don't notice anything. So it all depends but you can certainly get the advanced fibrosis from this. You can develop cirrhosis. Hey, James. Yeah. When I was in um, 101, we were on Pfizer for clinical, and I had a patient who, this was his third or second or third liver because he was a chronic alcoholic and he kept, you know, getting cirrhosis of the liver. So they gave him a liver with hep C. Can you do that? Oh, my gosh. And where did he get all these livers? This wasn't our liver team, was it? I don't think so. No. People go shopping for livers in dicey places sometimes. You know, working with students on a transplant floor for a long time, our uh, most transplant teams are very strict. If you have any kind of addictive history, alcoholism, drugs, or anything, you need an attestation from a, an inpatient facility and then a 12-step program to say you have been clean for this long period of time because there's not enough, of, I mean, transplant centers are in the business. It, there is a business side of transplants. You can't keep your transplant center going unless you transplant organs. But do they wanna take somebody on who we find, we have this good donatable liver, are we gonna give it to someone who's non-compliant? Non-compliance is the number one thing nationally that will knock you off a transplant list. If you don't comply with treatment prior to the transplant, you will not comply with daily need to take these anti-rejection drugs to keep your liver or your kidney, whatever it is, good. So someone who has this repetitive history, I can't imagine it's, it's the group at, at Maine, not that I have anything to do with them, but I've just not seen that in their practice. But there are places, there's sometimes they will turn people down and the patients say, well, where can I go? And they say, well, there's this place in Florida and there's this place in, where is it? I don't know. Arkansas, someplace trying to get off the ground and they'll give you one. They'll find one. They'll give you one. Well, what kind is it? I mean, what was the quality of this? This is terrible. But for you to be a renowned center, you can't get involved in that kind of nonsense. So I'm surprised. I would have been surprised if you said, yeah, they had them done at Maine. Mm. You know, and if you've had, typically if you've had one transplant and it goes bad, they look to see what the cause was. Is it non-compliance? Was it just, you know, for whatever reason you had an acute rejection, whatever it was, but they might give you a second if you're a good candidate, but after a second, you know, so sorry, we've done what we can. 
So, cause they won't waste the resources and there's no guarantee. And people oftentimes, it was a big shock to my students on that floor that people oftentimes end up much sicker after a transplant than they ever were before. And people would say to them, if I had known this, I would have just died. I don't want to live like this and this and that. And you can imagine the post conferences, the students would be like, why do they do this to people? Why do they do this? And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everyone's told then you get to pick, but yes, I want it. No, I don't. But, and they're very honest with them about how it can go. But we also don't see in the hospital, the people where it goes well, because they're not in the hospital. Their liver's working just fine. Their kidney's working just fine. So it, it can be a challenging place to work, but I know, and I'm not surprised after, and it's a huge surgery, so involved, but I'm not surprised that after three, he could find some place to scrape up a liver. Would you want a liver with hep C already? Because they're going to immunosuppress you, and that hep C is going to take you over. So I, I can't imagine what that paperwork was like for him to agree to that. It's just, I don't know. Isn't it too bad, though? I think it was Diamond that was talking, right? Isn't it too bad that he wanted liver so bad that he would go through that hellacious experience four times and still be drinking that, you know, he can't keep them. I mean, it's right. so he funny. admitted to me that he admitted to me that he wasn't going to stop. He was an older guy too. Oh my gosh! I mean, who would go through that? You know? I mean, they split you a T over, and it's. I mean, you're sick. It's a big surgery. What a shame. Well, anyway, so alcohol is certainly a cause for uh, hepatitis that can then become cirrhosis if they don't stop and end-stage liver. If someone has acute alcoholic hepatitis and they stop drinking and the body is otherwise healthy, you're not on chemo, you don't take immunosuppressive drugs, you're otherwise okay, you don't have comorbidities, it might resolve some. You might feel better, but you can't go back to it. You know, the liver is not that forgiving. All right, so chemical hepatotoxicity, what are we talking about here? Caused by systemic poisons. Thank God we see less of this. Carbon tetrachloride um, used to be, a, they used it in dry cleaning, they used it as a solvent to clean rugs and things. I mean, this was where people would go to work in these industries and get exposed to things that were hepatotoxic. So since the advent of OSHA, you know, the Occupational Safety Health Administration, that goes in and has standards and requires safety in the workplace. We don't have exposure to carbon tetrachloride and things like that. Gold compounds do not do well in the body. You can imagine, your body can't break that down. It's heavy, heavy metal. And they were injecting people's knees with gold because they thought it was a treatment for arthritis. Au contraire, it is not. So people who believe that would go wherever they could to get these gold injections, paying, you can imagine, whatever the price of gold was at the time. What are we doing here? So that's banned. They don't inject you with gold anymore because it'll cause you liver failure. So things like that, we put in this country, but we put things in to protect people, even in the workplace. All right, so now there's DILI. So this is drug-induced liver injury. And... It can be prescription drugs, it can be over-the-counter drugs, it can be herbal remedies, and that's a big rub for the public. People tend to think if they get it at Tally's or if they get it at a, a nutrition store, or a health food store, or it's homeopathic, or it's natural, it's harmless, and it's not. I mean, we got a lot of people in the ED at Maine with, you know, well, I took this and it's okay, it's gonna help me, it's this and that. No, it's put you into rhabdomyolysis, or, no, it puts you into kidney failure. Or no, it puts you into, you know, they can't just think that because it comes from the garden or it's natural somehow or it's been around, the Indians used it for years or whatever. I'm sure they learned when people died of a certain amount of it that you don't use that much. You know, there may have been however little demographic groups figured out what works as herbal remedies and what doesn't. They learned the hard way. We have more information on that because we have an FDA. So you have to be careful. So prescription drugs can do it. Anything with acetaminophen can do it. There's a lot of drugs that we know are hepatotoxic. You go and have a liver transplant, a kidney transplant, the drugs they give you so that you don't reject your organ are hepatic and nephrotoxic. We know that. They tell people that ahead of time. You have this diseased liver. We can offer you, we find you are a candidate for a liver. If one becomes available, you would be a candidate. Do you want a liver transplant? 
they tell them, chances are we're hoping it works. That's why we study these and do these so you walk out and you feel better. It could be that you are more chronically ill afterwards than you ever were before. It could be that we make your liver sick again because the only meds we have to give you to you know, hold off a rejection, your body rejecting this organ that is foreign to it, are also hepatotoxic. So after you're on those, they could kill your liver. Are you still willing to do this? And so people are told this up front. But so it can be prescription drugs for sure. It can be over the counter. Tylenol is over the counter. Tylenol will give you hepatic toxicity if you don't watch how much you take. Um, herbal remedies, like I say, people think nothing of herbal remedies. We had people in who were taking hydroxycut and were in liver failure. We, you know, because they think, oh, it's helpful, then I'll take it here, I'll take it here, I'll take, you know, what are we doing here? Um, you know, uh, what's the thing that's out there you can buy from people? Herbal life. Many people have come in taking herbal life and been in liver failure. You know, but it's so natural. It's so, no, it still can be toxic to your liver. Let's look at what you're taking. And you'll find when you admit people, they don't admit to these things. You'll say, What medications do you take? Oh, I don't take anything. You don't take anything. No, you don't take anything. No, nothing. I've been perfectly healthy. Well, good for you. So, what do you do every morning? Well, I take my insulin. Well, insulin's medication. No, I thought it was a hormone. Well, let's split hairs. It's a hormone, but it's also considered medication. You know, like this is how people are. You have to think how they think. So, how many times have I admitted someone you don't take any pill? Nothing. No medication? No. Okay. Any chance you could be pregnant? No, I'm on the pill. Okay. Guess what? <laughs> That's a medication. That's something I need to know. I mean, I don't say that to them, but so you have to dig a little past. They won't think of this as herbal. Green tea extract, the extract itself is some, something that puts people into liver failure. Um, black cohosh is another one. I don't know what it's supposed to do for you as an herbal whatever, but it can give you liver failure. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. There's another one out there that's odd. Oh, kava, I think it's called. And that's another one that we see. So, you know, be careful. Watch what you take. You know, just because it's herbal or natural or comes from a na nature store or something doesn't mean it's good. All right, so autoimmune hepatitis. Now, you know about autoimmune diseases. For some reason, your immune system is a little wonky and it's reacting to something normal that should be in your body as it's abnormal and foreign. So in this case, there's an inflammatory reaction that occurs because you are building up antibodies to your own liver, to your own hepatocytes. Your body is saying, it's funny, I don't think we recognize this organ anymore. It's grown a wild hair and it's doing this off the wall thing and you develop this autoimmune disease and it's killing your liver. So we see it because there's increased immunoglobins. When we do, you come in symptomatic and we're thinking, what is the cause here? So they do all the bloods and they do your ANAs and your anti-DNAs and all of that and it's coming up positive. And this is your problem. We also see it in people with other autoimmune disorders. Think about this concept. If you have one autoimmune disorder, if you have ulcerative colitis or uh, Crohn's disease or scleroderma or psoriasis or you, know, you name any one of the, the autoimmune diseases, you already have an aberrant reaction of your immune system to your body. What's to say you won't have others? So you always have your antenna up that, wow, this person has lupus. They already have an autoimmune disease. Now you're heightened to think they could have any other. Their immune system already isn't working right. So you're, they're prone to finding other ones. And that's what we see in people. Okay, so what else? You're going to get chronic hepatitis from this. The treatment is prednisone. Why? It's a corticosteroid. It's immunosuppressive, right? So they'll try that. They'll put azathioprine. Azathioprine is imuran. It's a strong drug. And so now we're suppressing your immune system even more. If no response, they're going to give you all the anti-rejection drugs. They're going to try you on cyclosporine. That's GenGraft that they give to liver transplant patients. They're going to try you on tacrolimus. That's ProGraph, they give that to liver patients. Methotrexate is chemo. 
They're going to put you on that and see if that suppresses it enough because you get immunosuppression from chemotherapy and it's broad. Um, they'll give you mycophenolate, that's Celsept. So they're going to give you all these drugs that we use for anti-rejection for the properties. You're not having a rejective episode of an organ, but we use them for the properties that they're going to immunosuppress you. Just like when you have a transplant, we immunosuppress you big time so that you don't see that organ and say, that's, that's Joe Schmo's liver, that's not mine, and your immune system goes and kills it. We have to suppress that reaction. So we take that science and we apply it to someone who has an autoimmune disease. And we say, here you have this, your body is saying, this used to be Jane Benetti's liver, God forbid this would happen. <laughs> this used to be Jane Benetti's liver, today it doesn't feel like her liver and it goes after it. We're gonna stop that. So let's use the science we know from transplants and apply it here. And we're gonna give you these same drugs. All of these drugs listed are hepatotoxic. And when they start prescribing them, they'll say, now, I have a drug I can give you, but I want you to understand the side effect of this drug is that it can cause you liver disease. It's a strong drug. So we can try it and see by dose, can we control it a little and buy you some time before you're in this liver disease or not give it to you and you stay with this autoimmune hepatitis and you're gonna die from it. So it's a risk benefit ratio. Some people are more reactive, let's say to GenGraph than they are to ProGraph or they're more reactive to CellCept than they are to GenGraph. It all depends. So if they give you one and your liver goes out of whack, then they'll say, oh, okay, Maybe not the gen graph so much. Let's pull that back. Or maybe let's cut the dosage. They still want to get your immune response under control, but they don't want to kill the liver ahead of time. All right, metabolic causes. Wilson's disease. This is a problem with copper transport, where you don't think probably that you transport copper in your body, but you do, and your liver's involved. And what happens here is you have a genetic defect that doesn't transport it well, and the liver does not suffer heavy metal. So here you have this copper and it makes your liver sick because it can't get rid of it. Now, these people, if you ever come across a Wilson's disease, I've probably had five that, my, that I brought my students into. I always go into them and I say, do you mind if I bring, you know, I tell them I'm a teacher and all that. Could I bring my students in to see your eyes? <laughs> they have copper colored rings in their irises. It's a hallmark sign, it's very interesting. But until you, you know, until we have a patient with it, and every single one of them has always said to me over the years, oh, please do bring them in. I want people to understand about my disease. So then I bring a stream of people in to see these Kaiser Fleischer rings. It's interesting. All right, hemochromatocytosis is generally hereditary and you're not breaking down your iron. So you have too much. Again, how does the body suffer with heavy metals? Not well. So if they don't watch it, then you could really develop some serious liver disease. We have primary biliary cholangitis. This is the um, small bile ducts and they get inflamed. And when bile ducts are inflamed, you get cholestasis because you cannot get rid of the bile and it gets static and you get inflammation. And so from this, you can end up with a real liver failure, real liver disease, it's terrible. So that's something to think about. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is worse. This is of the big bile ducts. And not only is there inflammation, but there's fibrosis and there's sclerosing. It gets hardened and rigid. And you have stasis. You have cholestasis again. You can't move the bile at all. So, um, you know, people can end up with liver failure. They can end up with a transplant. Now, the thing is, the risk benefit there is always if we take it out and give you another liver, it's in your genetic makeup. It's your autoimmune disease, whatever's causing it. Is this gonna start all over again? Are you still gonna start doing this to your bile ducts with a new liver? And that's the, that's the transplant team to weigh. Then you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is no alcohol involved. You have fatty deposits. It can be obesity, it doesn't have to be. There's plenty of thin people walking around with uh, NAFLD. So it doesn't have to be. But the fact that there's fat deposits is gonna make it difficult over time for you know, blood to flow well, for bile to flow well, because it's building up and depositing throughout the parenchyma, throughout the mass of the liver. Um, NASH is different. This is more severe. This is non-alcoholic, I mean, this is a um, non-alcoholic, but it's a steatohepatitis. 
So this is fat deposits, but it's causing inflammation. It's causing much more disease. It's inflaming all around the hepatocytes. The, um, the fat deposits are everywhere. The whole liver is reacting to it. And it's the main cause of cirrhosis. And you can end up, end up with a transplant here with this as well. So if you're up on a liver floor, you'll see these things. You'll see how these people fare. OK, uh, what else? Collaborative care. There's no specific treatment. What can we do? You have to allow people rest. You have to allow them to regenerate. They don't have energy. And they just seem to lay there. But the body, metabolism takes a lot of work, you know? Adequate nu nutrition, we have to get nutrition in them. If they can't eat it, we have to get it through feedings, through TPN, through something. They can't get through. Nobody gets better without eating. Nobody. So we're trying to reduce the metabolic demands. They're total care patients, these, these end-stage livers. And I tell my students, go in. They can see all the issues they have, and they need a lot of care. So they're really good for them. Um, the parameters of care are going to depend how much the patient's able to do, what kind of meds they're on, how much drain, how much they're drained from the treatment, how progressive the liver disease is. They have to stay away from alcohol. They have to. You know, it's the byproducts of alcohol. It, ETOH breaks down to this acetylaldehyde and hydrogen, and it damages the tissue. So, you know, people say, well, I did it in my 20s, I drank, and this and that. Okay. You can't do it your whole life. Your liver is not going to tolerate it. It's not worth losing your liver. We try and get them diversional activities in the hospital. They're in bed. They're lethargic. They have no energy, no appetite. They're laying there. And so they have to do something. Try and get them involved in things online. That's the hospital put in all those keyboards and screens, and they can get on and do interactive things. And we just find it's good for anybody who's on bed rest to have diversional activity. Uh, they have got to comply with follow-up care. This is a long, chronic road they're on. They have to comply and follow up. Education about their treatment. Everyone should understand the drugs they're taking. On whatever simple level you have to talk to them, you meet people where they are, find the demographic level they're at, and try and get them to understand what we're giving them. Everybody should understand that. So what do you do? Assess your patients. Know their history. What was the onset? What was the exposure? Was it chemicals? What kind of meds did they take? Teach them risks of their behavior, risks to make their disease worse, how important it is to comply. You have to support people, whether it's an A through E person who might find themselves in your hospital. Outside people are not thinking about hepatitis A through E. And it's devastating to them. And if they have B and C and it's chronic and they're really sick from it, I mean, think of these people who have to deal with what they did a single day in their life 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and now they're chronically ill from it. So, you know, you give them support. You know, they're not familiar with this. Excuse me, it's a lot for them to handle. Don't forget your precautions. All right, so nursing diagnoses, you love these. So imbalanced nutrition. Remember, their nutrition intake is poor because they're anorexic. But also their cellular nutrition is not good because the liver's not doing what it should to keep you healthy. It can't. It's diseased. Activity intolerance. They're shot. They have no energy reserves. They are a complete care patient. Impaired liver function, for sure. And depending on what we find is wrong with them, we know that's what's affected during the progression of illness. You know, maybe they're not anemic in the beginning because it's just not affecting the iron stores yet. Maybe it's something else they're having. You know, you have to go by the symptoms. What your assessment data tells you, we know, oh, they weren't uh, anemic yesterday. They are now. Or, oh, they had uh, plenty of coag factors. They weren't bleeding yesterday like this. Uh, this week, they're bleeding a lot more. So we can tell the progression of disease by your assessment and your symptoms, what you see this patient has. The goal is always to not have them be uncomfortable. We want them to resume whatever they can do to have some measure of quality of life. And we hope that their liver functions are restored. I mean, we're trying to optimize people's health. So liver transplantation, this is an option if you have end-stage liver disease. And in some places, 
maybe not main, if you have localized hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, chronic viral hepatitis is the primary indicator for sure. Now, again, Lewis is telling us 6,000 are done annually. It could be more than that. I mean, I know they do quite a few at Maine. Um, and there's more and more centers popping up all the time. They're not easy to maintain. And I know at Maine, the last time I was talking to the guy over livers, I said, we had a patient admitted who said, they did my liver seven years ago. And the whole liver team looked and said, he's ours? I don't think he's ours. Who's this guy? I don't know. And I said, you don't know your own? I mean, they really carefully track them. And one of them turned to me and he said, we don't track them after five years, there's no point. And I said, oh, and he's a seven year person, so he's already off the radar. So um, it turns out he was one of theirs. And I said, you should be capturing this data. He survived seven years when you only give them five. I mean, that's, you know. So anyway, um, there's, there's probably a lot more than it was when, when this book was published. So they intensely screen you for comorbidities. The contraindications, metastatic disease, forget it. If you have had a cancer somewhere else that can metastasize to your liver, no, because they're gonna immunosuppress you. And don't forget another action of immunosuppressive drugs is that they increase your risk of cancer. So we're gonna do that, we're changing cellular function. We're gonna do that and increase your risk of cancer in someone who has already had a primary cancer somewhere that can tend to um, metastasize to the liver, they're off the table which is why that line about hepatocellular carcinoma, it's not metastatic, but I don't know. I, at, at, our, at Maine, it would have to be, I don't know. I don't know how localized it would have to be. I can't imagine them doing it for hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, Non-compliance is a big one. If you couldn't follow your diabetic regimen, if you couldn't follow your appointments leading up to your transplant, if you couldn't come and go to the classes and whatnot, you are off the list. Because if you're not complying now, you won't comply later and they're not gonna skew, they're in the business of transplants, they're not gonna skew their data with someone who's not complying with treatment. Uh, ongoing ETOH and drug use, no. That's it, you're off. If you don't have an attestation that you're clean, you've been to a facility and you're clean, you've been to a 12-step and they're attesting that you're done, um, they won't even look at you. So again, it's the compliance. All right, cadaver versus liver plant, bleh, transplants, and I'll let you go. We have, I think we have like two slides. So cadavers are most common. Do they do split livers? They do, not at Maine, but they do them other places. There's a big incidence of biliary disease, you can imagine. They're cutting, if you're the donor, they're cutting your liver down the middle, giving one half to somebody else and leaving you with the other half. So they're reworking bile ducts. They're reworking all your vasculature. They're reworking all of their vasculature. Biliary disease is common, thrombosis is common, pneumos because we are right under the liver doing all that surgery, um, wound infections. You know, the liver when it's diseased cannot filter infection. They are prone to gram-negative sepsis. Gram-positive, but gram-negative more in a hospital environment. It's Klebsiella and E. coli and all that stuff. So um, you can have ileus certainly afterwards, absolutely. You can have um, any number of clotting issues and all of that. This, these are people who don't clot well, and now they're doing a major surgery on you. So they have bleeding tendencies, and then when we try and control that bleeding, they can clot. So it's, it's um, dicey business. The success rate with split livers is much, much lower than it is with cadavers. Uh, bleeding, infection, rejection are always the big things with transplants. Survival is best in a five-year window. It's gonna depend on the condition of the patient and the need, why they had to have it. All right, so anti-rejection therapy, I touched on these already. Uh, the calcium neuron inhibitors, Gengraf, Prograf, Imuran. Uh, two months following are probably the most critical. An infection of any kind is gonna be masked by the medication they're taking. So you can't just say, well, they don't have a fever. Well, the wound isn't red. Well you know, they don't have increase in white blood cells. Think of what we're doing with the treatment. You're not gonna see that. We have to go by other markers, other issues. It can be very difficult to see who's sick when they're that immunosuppressed. Um, they always have the ability to be reinfected by a virus. Now they're an immunosuppressed population and they're a fresh post-op. 
and anything could come along and get them. You know, we're kind of taking care of that immune system. So typically they're in ICU until they're extubated and stable. Neurostat is constantly, these are people who previously bled, now are clotting. So you can have who knows what from that diseased liver that has gone out into circulation. Watch for the bleeding tendency. They can still have it and they've got multiple anastomotic sites of big vessels. So anytime they're suturing all the way around a vein or all the way around an artery, you can have leakage and seepage and this is a very vascular organ. So you gotta watch for that. IV fluids, keep your lines patent, prevent the respiratory complications, incentive spirometer, turn, cough, deep breathe, all of the stuff we do, the post-op stuff we do for every surgical case. Um, watch their electrolytes. They will have drains, they'll have a JP most likely, they'll have um, well, a hemovac maybe, they'll have T-tubes, they'll have an NG tube down for decompression. They're gonna have tubes and you have to make sure they're all working because they'll defeat the purpose. Um, urine output's important. In, when we talk about cirrhosis, we'll talk about how end-stage livers can also have renal involvement. So it's important to watch their urine output. Okay. All right, guys, take your lunch and I will see you um, after lunch. We have an hour. So I'll see you in a little while. Okay. Thanks for your patience. I'm five minutes over. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, for